We have talked about the robot revolution before and some of the companies that are going to benefit once robots and automation take over what humans used to have to do, very expensive humans. This week, Chris and I met with a key player in an industry that we knew would benefit, but the conversation really opened up our eyes to just how big of an impact this really could have for a company that we have liked but have not loved. We learned just how big they've already become, how much market share they're stealing from other competitors, how much traction they're getting outside of the product that we commonly think of this brand of, and the best part, the stock price happens to already be down 70% from its high last November. So today on Dumb Money, we're going to tell you what we learned and decide just how much we're going to invest in a company that we think could be the 40x investment opportunity of the decade. We are Dumb Money. Three friends who turn $30,000 into $30 million using nothing more than Twitter and a zero commission trading account. The suits that work on Wall Street, they call those people the smart money. <laughs> That's not us. Our goal is to help level the playing field for everyday investors. We are dumb money. Hey there, Dave here along with Chris and Jordan. We are Dumb Money. Welcome to Dumb Money Live. Thank you guys so much for watching today. We really do need your help waking up the YouTube algorithm for a few reasons. It is summer. The stock market has been pretty much boring for months now. Uh, we've been on vacation. I'm sure a bunch of you have been on vacation, but this is a video that needs to be seen. So I'm asking everyone watching right now, take one second and tap the like button. It is simple, it is free. Chris, Jordan, it is good to see you uh, both. Chris and I just got back from a quick trip to New York uh, for a pre-launch event for uh, the ice cream store investment. Uh, if you smash the like button, we will uh, tell you how that's coming along at the end of the video. Lots of exciting things happening there. But first, we need to talk about the stock that we got excited about after one of our meetings in New York. The stock is DoorDash. D-A-S-H is the ticker symbol, and it goes way deeper j than just robot deliveries. That is one of at least six huge factors that I can think of that makes this stock attractive. So let's uh, let's dive into it. Where do you guys want to start? Yeah, I mean, I think, Dave, I think the impetus for this, like you said, was we had a, a lengthy conversation with an individual in our network who I would say might be one of the most, has some of the best insight into this uh delivery sector this last mile delivery sector uh this individual uh is affiliated with a handful of businesses that are deeply involved with this sector he kind of sees things in real time as they're happening so uh, what he basically he basically asked us what our number one stock was and number two stock was and what we had those conversations he said well you want to know what my number one stock is and i was like what He's like, DoorDash. I was like, okay, this is interesting. Let, let's listen to what he has to say. Because for him to be that invested in DoorDash means that like, he's, not, he's not investing blind, right? He, he has such great insight into it. So he gave us his thesis. And I just want to say that he think, his thesis is that this could be a trillion dollar company, uh, assuming that they execute, continue to execute. Um, and I thought that was interesting, Dave, because they're valued at what twenty three billion today, or something like I that. Twenty eight. So that, like, that could be wrong. Twenty eight. I thought it was like twenty three. Oh, could be. let's just call it a thirty to forty x or so, something it's, in there. Yeah, over I'm the seeing twenty three point eight billion at today's uh, price of sixty six dollars. They IPO'd. It was a huge IPO uh, at one hundred and two dollars a share, and that made headlines when they popped all the way up to two hundred plus. Um, but you know, everything's been having trouble this year. And now they're okay, down below but that. But here's the thing. DoorDash, there is a strong, like, negative short thesis on DoorDash. And I don't think yes. we can have a conversation about DoorDash. First of all, I am not investing in DoorDash right now. I have zero shares. Um, we're too. not financial advisors, right? This is just kind of us kind of in ingesting this conversation, talking through his thesis, looking at the other side of the thesis which is the short thesis and trying to kind of figure out for ourselves is there something here enough that we should take a look at doordash so we just wanted to bring you into our kind of thinking and invite the community to kind of chime in on this hopefully have a conversation on our discord dummy.tv forward slash discord uh and i don't know i i haven't made up my mind yet so the the short thesis is pretty simple guys we're entering a recession we pretty much most people would agree on that point. And DoorDash is not cheap. Uh, DoorDash, in fact, when you order through DoorDash, a lot of restaurants actually increase the pricing on their menu 
so that they can absorb the 20 to 30 plus percent DoorDash fees. So you're paying more for each menu item. You're also paying a delivery fee unless you're uh, ex what a Dash Express Dash, or Dash whatever Pass. they call it. Dash, Dash Pass. Pass. It's like member, a $10 a month we, subscription, which I think you and I are both subscribers to it because we're frequent users of DoorDash, are, but I also it, use Uber Eats. Me too, but also uh, there's a huge tip that you have to pay. So there's just a lot of fees. And in a recession, are people still willing to kind of pay a premium for the convenience of DoorDash? Has the change of behavior and the psychological impact of that change of behavior, is it strong enough to continue to allow DoorDash to continue their growth rate, right? Like, like that's a that's a big, big question in the in a recessionary period. Also, there are some strong competitors. Uber is a monster competitor. Uber Eats, right, big competitor uh, in the space. There's some huge international competitors. Uh, Will it be a race to the bottom there? I don't know. Will will rest? Will people in general post pandemic uh, continue to use DoorDash when they now are okay going out to restaurants? That's a big part of the short thesis, guys. Is Historically, that if you read restaurants, short... dining at restaurants does not do well during a recession, right? And if you think of what DoorDash is, it is a convenient version of dining at a restaurant at a higher price, but getting to do it in your own dining well, room. Dave beyond the recession, just post pandemic, getting back to real life, you don't need to order to your house theoretically, if you're okay going out into the world and vacationing and eating at restaurants, yeah. that should theoretically have a negative impact on DoorDash's business. DoorDash is being, being like kind of targeted as a pandemic stock that now needs to pay the price, meaning and that their growth is going to absolutely. dramatically- well, look, I mean, so they and I think that that's huge growth during the pandemic and we know why it makes perfect sense. Um, but there's there's even something further than that. And so there there was uh, recently within the last, it might've been a few days ago, there was an Atlantic article story that came out. And the concept is this, that VCs have been subsidizing the millennial lifestyle for the past decade, right? And so that money could be drying up. And so at that point, who's investing in DoorDash at like, I don't know what four or five times sales, I think is what it is right now, um, just to keep these VC multiples up. It's still an expensive stock. Um, it's an expensive stock. But Jordan, the They've impact of what that article is saying is that Door all the investment capital, the billions of dollars of cash that DoorDash has enables them to provide a product that is cheaper than it will be in the future because they're essentially subsidizing the product now right. to get us hooked. And at but it's some still point, expensive, right? Even at the subsidized price, it's expensive. But they're, they're claiming that they're going to increase the prices on us in the coming years. And once that happens, the same thing with Uber. People are going to be like, I was fine using the product when it was cheap. But now that you're increasing the pricing because your VC money has run out and you have to become profitable, I'm out. Some portion of those DoorDash users are going to say, right. I'm not paying even higher fees. I'm out. So that's and a that, thesis too. You're right. Yes. Like, and, and that's where the our kind of bullish thesis on DoorDash comes in because you, you would think that, you know, they're going to lose this subsidy from VC. But in fact, DoorDash is becoming more optimized, more streamlined, going to be able to operate at a lower margin. And when you factor in robot drivers, that that one of their biz, biggest expenses is paying drivers. Okay, well, Dave, Dave, I think I think we started off really strong presenting the short thesis. And it's it is it is a it is a considerable short thesis on this stock that everyone needs to be aware of. Let's just talk about the thesis that this individual had, that would be a strong long thesis. It started off with they have stolen so much market share from the competitors that Seamless, Grubhub, even Uber Eats, um, uh, all of these competitors, they've been stealing their business. And the visibility that this person seems to have into just like local restaurants and stuff, yeah. including, you know, this person's this, restaurant. It this seems here is, like this is third party data showing that DoorDash has 59%. That mirrors what our uh, friend told us. Uber Eats at 24%, Grubhub at 14%, Postmates at 3%, and other 1%.
the seamless. And the restaurant network has become so large at DoorDash that they are now evidently uh, starting to, you know, decrease their growth in salespeople, potentially even laying off. Who knows? Laying off salespeople. I don't know if that's actually happened, but that was part of the thesis that they no longer kind of need so yeah. many salespeople because they have because they already have the restaurant footprint. It's already done, and the salespeople at DoorDash are a tremendous cost factor for that company. And if now they're able to kind of pull the reins back on high sales and marketing costs to acquire re new restaurants, that is going to increase margins for the company. Also, a big part of the thesis was that they've done an outstanding job uh, transitioning their customers or converting their customers to Dash Pass, and Dash Pass is a huge part of their customer base. I think it's like, what, 600 million a year straight to their bottom line, and they're just growing it every single quarter. That's and just it, costs, like, it costs roughly the same as Prime, doesn't it? It's nine ninety nine a month. So yeah. yes, it's it's an so expensive it's pass. Yeah. But if you use it, it actually saves you a lot of money on your orders. And if you have subscribed to it, they found that it increases the stickiness the same way that Prime does. Once you've bought in, once you're spending $10 anyway, just for the privilege of having a discount on DoorDash, you're gonna use DoorDash a lot more. And Chris and I use DoorDash all the time. We found that firsthand. Seven to 10 times a week, uh, we're ordering it for random things, whether it's a breakfast, Are a lunch, the kids me? need food. I've used and... DoorDash twice in my life. And both times I, was, I looked at the receipt when I was done, like, no thanks. I can, it, I know how to drive. It is more expensive. And that's where this recession fear is the problem because Chris is going to continue spending money at a high rate, but um, people who are more price sensitive are, are potentially not. But we've seen as this recession is approaching and as prices are going out of control, here is, here is the growth path of that, uh, the breakdown of the, the market share. This is, this is a different uh, data that shows it over time. You see the giant spike there in March of 2020, and everyone's been going up. But if you, if you see that the others have kind of been consistent, Postmates is, is decreasing, Uber Eats is fairly consistent around 25-ish percent, but DoorDash is, is growing the market. The market for people By doing way, this has been growing charts. through this 2022. Is, this is chart crime. <laughs> when they stack like this, it's hard to differentiate because it. I mean, you, like Postmates is up there, but then they haven't grown at all, really. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's this is a terrible chart. Yeah, I I, I agree. Postmates def is definitely losing, kind of losing some of their business, and I think yeah. the concept here, George. Oh, by the way, another short thesis I, I I forgot to mention earlier is these. I mean, energy prices, gas prices, right? Who's absorbing that? Uh, I don't know at what point. Well, so if Uber's raised their prices, right? And so. You know, I think in that that's where, where they can, kind of where they can. I don't think they're in all markets. They put that gas surcharge uh, in effect. So, you know, that's a short term negative for sure for DoorDash. Well, Although besides I have just a gas surcharge, they can just raise rates. Uh, they, they can't. Yeah. Well, they, but how much can you, you know, how much can you raise rates? There's already well, like a point thing. of contention with DoorDash members is paying all those fees and the tip and everything else. Um, listen, I think the Dash Pass is a big piece of this because there's a network effect here of you're not willing to pay monthly fees to all these services. So if there's one particular service that can provide enough value, and I'll, we'll get into that in a minute, uh, that hits your life on a regular basis, you can see the cost savings. That is something you're likely willing to pay for. And once you pay for that, you're going to consciously think about going back to that app all the time to get your money wor money's worth from that monthly fee that you're paying. And I can tell you right now, 7-Eleven, they're based out of Dallas. They had a huge launch, I think it was a year, year and a half ago of their home delivery service. They were basically paying you to use their home delivery service. Mm -hmm. I used it a couple of times. It was great. It was efficient. Um, it saved me money. Like it was cheaper. I think it was like free, completely free. And you know what? I never went back to that 7-Eleven app and I don't even know why. It's because I have DoorDash. I'm paying for DoorDash. They have all the same stuff that 7-Eleven has inside their app. And my brain is accustomed to opening up that DoorDash app. And so like, yeah. It's and Chris, the 7-Eleven near our house is on DoorDash, and you can get 7-Eleven items delivered through the DoorDash app as a part of your Dash Pass. It's probably cheaper it's... to go through 7-Eleven's app, but we don't do it because it's just, it, we're just, 
our brain just goes to DoorDash and we want to leverage the DoorDash fee that we're paying, right? And Chris, you, early on during pandemic times, you were, I, I think you were using Uber Eats and Chow Now and all these random apps. I told you how good the algorithm, it's, they basically have the TikTok algorithm of home delivery apps because once it learns what you like, they start presenting the things that they, that's how I decide what I'm gonna have for dinner. It's like, oh, just see what the app says. Oh yeah, this, that one looks good. It's usually the third recommendation. It's good. Listen, I, I don't know that it's really that much better than Uber Eats. I think Uber Eats does a pretty good job too. I think all of them have terrible customer service. I hate how difficult it is when you have something go wrong with your DoorDash order or Uber really? Eats order. I, I, Uber Eats I, I found it very easy. I just chat in, hey, this this item was missing and they credit me back for that item. That, that's not true that you, you, you can, you basically say, you have to say an item is missing. You have to lie. If something's wrong with the item, they will not talk to you. They will only give you like a partial refund on that specific item. But like if you have to say that you didn't get something in order to get any money back. And that actually is interesting and it will lead to our next next bull a, thesis on DoorDash. A big, cost for them. A, big, a big cost driver for them right now are refunds to where people are going saying, hey, my item's just not there because they're pissed off because they got the sauce wrong or they were missing something or just wasn't cooked correctly. So they just say they didn't get it. And DoorDash basically, I think, instantaneously refunds you for that item. And they are paying for that. So that is a huge cost driver. So I think the evolution of DoorDash, as they have come out and repeatedly said, is they want to be the last mile delivery service for everything and they've yeah. already embarked on this new vision of being able to use doordash not for food but yeah. for flowers for literally anything in your life right their, their and, new mission statement is uh, growing and empowering local economies and their their goal is to deliver everything faster than you can get it from amazon prime for example right now if you Dave, want triple a batteries four million drivers four, yeah, four million, million drivers that are like they only are doing delivery right and how long does it take to get an iphone or or i you know an apple macbook delivered to your house 22 minutes sometimes to your house when yeah. you order it that's better than next day better than two days for yeah. amazon gotta say uh, and Uber, Uber also is in that last mile business. They also had a huge push to be that um, that last mile delivery. But the adoption has seemed to be bigger on the B two B side with DoorDash. Um, I think that if DoorDash is, and by the way, some of the early numbers, uh, and that's what we were kind of talking about over this, uh, you know, with this individual, is some of the early use cases of DoorDash experimenting beyond food with individual retailers have been extraordinarily successful. Uh, and if that type of success scales out uh, nationally, if not globally, uh, with much larger retailers and this concept of having things delivered to your house in 30, 45 minutes from essentially any store you can imagine, that is a game changer for DoorDash. One. It's really easy for a restaurant to mess up your food and for you to demand a refund from DoorDash, which happens to me about one of every five orders, <laughs> okay? Five or six orders, it's a nightmare. But it, it's really hard to mess up an order of like some random thing. It just is what it is, right? And so DoorDash won't have the cost uh, associated with that segment of the business. Um, I think it's huge, Dave, if they can pull this off. I don't know that they necessarily will, I love Amazon. You love. We all love Amazon. But I could see myself splitting my purchases between Amazon and then things that I want same day. I can see that happening. Yeah. Well, and Amazon's making a big push for same day deliveries too. In some markets, a lot of the items I buy now are showing up by two p.m. the day I order it. Um, but I think that there is. <laughs> Everybody needs everything faster, and as soon as a recession ends and people are spending like crazy again, then uh, they're willing to pay a subscription fee to get things faster if the thing that they're buying doesn't cost more to get it faster. Yeah. I, and these companies I think continue to do that, right? As, you know, as energy fees keep, you know, climbing higher and we get, uh, 
you know, more expensive automobiles, more expensive hourly labor. Um, can they keep offering these things for affordable prices? Well, what about so, the what about the electric powered robot that doesn't uh, need a four hundred one k or sick time? Yeah, look. So I mean, you can't really roll that across the entire United States. Maybe you know you're going to have to figure out where you're going to start, um, and maybe you can do that in denser cities, San Francisco, New York. Um, but I just don't see yeah. that that's a really viable option for you know, 99% of the geography that they cover um, anytime soon. I, I don't okay. see it happening in a short time frame, but yeah. I completely think that at some point in our lifetimes, the idea of a UPS man dropping off packages at your house will be a, a relic of the past. Yeah, I don't know, but the automated's tough, right? The problem is there's no real good infrastructure for this. So the automated is like the most technically complex way to do it. There's actually a startup, I think they're in Dallas, that. Um, He's talking about using, you know, like the old school bank tubes, like putting mm -hmm. in a series of tubes places, right? And then you can figure out the maximum size and then you could get uh, just no more driving. You just, you need some toothpaste, boom, it's in your tube. You're going to tube it to your house? Tube it, tube it. Oh, well, maybe the boring company could get involved. Wait, are That's we right. already talking about the robo delivery bots? Is that, I'm sorry, I lost track, yeah. guys. Is that what you're talking about? Well, I'm just yeah. saying that he, he's Jordan's point was energy prices are going to go up and humans are expensive, but robots, electric powered robots are not. Well, and, listen, and that that's not going to happen overnight. Like obviously. energy density wise, I mean that's you know next to ideal um, because then you can figure out so you're not having to transport thousands of pounds of automobile and you know hundreds of pounds of human along with the goods. <laughs> Uh, Jordan, they're doing it right now. We had that conversation. These little delivery yeah. robots are already experimenting in cities. Yeah, look, and no, I LA. agree with that. I'm just my point is that you're, that's not going to work for 99% of the geographies that DoorDash covers um, anytime soon. Um, it will eventually, um, but I don't. Yeah, I, I think I it will we're eventually. Be there for, and Leon, Leon and I were talking about this uh, for a decade. Um, so right now, um, right now. They're in, I think, in certain areas of LA, they're starting to program them not only to go across sidewalks and streets, and they're getting sidewalk permits to deliver these, but they're yeah. going into buildings and going up elevators to floors. Like it, it's, it's, we all know it's coming. It's just a matter of whether it's five years or 15 years, right? Or 20 years. We just don't know. Yeah. But if and when that happens, that is a radical improvement in the economy of DoorDash's business model, right? All of their cost are coming from humans that they have to pay to deliver these things. And if you can get rid of the human, you not only increase the cost efficiency for DoorDash, but not having to tip is a huge deal. Most of what I pay for DoorDash is my tip. My tip is the majority of my fee by a mile, right? Because I have the Dash Pass and you have to tip, right? Like yeah. it could cost you $7, $10, $12 for a tip. If you could erase that tip, I'm telling you right now, I am getting everything delivered 100% of the time if I can get rid of the tip. So I think it's coming. And if and when that day happens, you're talking about a company that today is, is cash flow positive. They have EBITDA profits where they're not profitable is when you account for their employee, their employee uh, stock compensation. Okay, so once you start backing out that compensation from the EBITDA numbers, DoorDash is not profitable. So they're kind of like right on the fringe of being truly profitable. They're cash flow profitable, but if you could start removing that cost of labor, it's a game changer. But there is something that they're doing right now today or in the very near term future that will dramatically increase their profitability. If we go back to the fact that we stated earlier, which is that they basically have full penetration of restaurants in the United States, they are now at a place where they could start removing restaurants from the app that are far from your house. Because right yeah. now there are restaurants that are like 15 miles from my house that are on there, which blows my mind that they're delivering this stuff to me. Once they remove those restaurants, and they have to do it carefully because they still want to be able to offer you enough diversity. Mm -hmm. They could increase the number of deliveries per hour from something like 1.8 to like 2.8 or three. Yeah, if, if, if each is... driver can do three deliveries instead of two deliveries in an hour, it just makes them actually profitable. Hugely more profitable. So that is something that they're working on right now 
that again, assuming they could execute on that plan, I think that's the type of thing that allows us to see this company become fairly profitable over the next, call it kind of two to six quarters, okay, if, if they can pull that off. So, and then the one other thing we haven't trip. mentioned is they, they made an acquisition of a of a foreign version of DoorDash that operates in like 25 other countries and they're they're going to be able to roll the same optimization and learnings that they've had here and technology uh, into that into those other markets. It was a Wolta is the name of the company. Yeah, it was a it was a fairly large multi-billion dollar acquisition and the concept here is that DoorDash can layer in best practices, processes, uh, you know, Dash Pass, all of these things that they've learned, create a truly global network um, between delivery drivers, which is interesting, by the way, because it allows you to, as a you know, DoorDash driver, some additional flexibility. But even as a DoorDash user, no matter where you travel, uh, you'll be able to get DoorDash through kind of one synced app experience. I think it's fascinating. DoorDash, in order to get that $10 fee forever, and to have people not cancel it, you need to be able to provide them with more things in more places, right? If it becomes a truly global company that's delivering everything last mile, I see it as as a subscription staple in my life. Now my life's irrelevant because like I'm less, yeah, you know, cost sensitive. But I think a lot of people are going to see that as yeah, it's worth the nine ninety nine a month if I can get everything delivered, even when I'm traveling. That's pretty darn cool. So there are some interesting things from a long thesis. Can it be a trillion dollar company? I think if you add the robo delivery, however long that takes, at that point, maybe, maybe. They have 5 million people with Dash Pass paying 10 bucks a month. If they can grow that to 25 million people, 30 million people, that gets to be really, really interesting because they're making money from so many areas at that point. And by the way, let's not forget the whole private label game, right? You know that's coming. They're already doing it at DoorDash. So once they have you, they could start to show you more yeah. profitable, right? We the know Dash you can get Mart this from alternative to your local grocery store is is so much more profitable for them. They don't and if need they got they don't into need other to... categories. If they started housing warehouses the way Amazon does near near your uh, geographic location and can get things to you same same hour. But Dave, how about what Amazon has done with advertising, right? In a way, DoorDash could become as impactful of an advertising medium as as Amazon has, right? The same way they do with restaurants, because when you're a restaurant, people might not realize this, we're about to get into the virtual kitchen game with Dylan's Ice Cream Company, right? So we have a really fun product that we'll be delivering hopefully very soon nationwide through DoorDash, Uber Eats and all the apps. Uh, and you have to pay for marketing exposure. If you want to show up at the top of that page so people can actually see your virtual restaurant, you have to pay DoorDash. And if you start ordering, if people start ordering enough through your brand, then maybe it starts showing up naturally, right? But they could do that, Dave, with every product category, theoretically, right? If they get to other products. There it is, cake cup creamery. That is this will be coming to a DoorDash and Uber Eats near you soon. This is why we were in New York. We had a, uh, a, a tasting event, an unveiling event of these uh, products that you'll be able to get in your very own house. Dave, ha by the way, this is cakecupcreamery.com if you guys want to learn more. It's a company we've been working on for a good year, year and a half. Uh, Dave, how good was the product? Honestly, like honest opinion, how good? Like, no, I, I went into it thinking, okay, yeah, I know what it is. It's ice cream and cake. How, how exciting could that be? It was so, like, I don't know what Dylan did to formulate this, but it is so good. Like the, the frost, it's like, it's, it's not whipped cream. It's like almost like a frosting layer that just is so amazing. Like, okay, let me show you the, the product again. Dave, um, you're blurred on screen for some reason, by the way. Just so you know, people are commenting. Well, not anymore. I'm, not anymore. Okay, good. Probably I'm doing too many things, trying to pull up a video of, of Dylan making ice cream. But, um, yeah, it was, it was an amazing product. It was so good. I think that I, this was the first, like, tasting event. I think they're going to do some more of those. Uh, we'll, we'll keep you guys posted. 
Yeah, got, and by the way, for those of y'all who don't know, Dylan is the ice cream kid on TikTok that we uh, partnered with a year ago, and we are trying to develop multiple venture scalable brands around Dylan. It's a kind of an experiment for us to work with other content creators and to help content creators who want to scale out their own ventures, right, outside of content. Uh, so this is the first, that's, hopefully that's it's the, the first, first phase, a home delivery phase. We have an actual physical store opening in late July. Is that, or, uh, July 29th. It's not 29th? formally released yet, but yeah, July 29th in, in NoHo right across the street from, uh, uh, Kith, Kith kids, uh, in New York city. So if you have a trip planned, uh, to New York, July 29th or later, it's something you definitely want to visit. It's going to be the world's first truly experiential ice cream store. Throwing ice cream, having fun with ice cream, content creators taping funny ice cream stuff every day. It's it's a whole thing. So it's cool to get to share that with you guys. Yes, we're still doing the healthy cookie company that we can't talk about that yet, but soon we'll talk about that as well, Leon. Um, so many things. Man, so so many things, but this is this is how DoorDash, right? This is this is how DoorDash came up because our head was in the virtual kitchen kind of game and we were around a lot of people that had a lot of insight into this industry sector and you know, we just wanted to share the Look, Oh, there's the store. a lot of people are, you know, kind of out on this DoorDash idea um and I I've got a few thoughts here. One um Look, it's an idea. It's not. We're not all saying like, look, we're all in. We're going all in on DoorDash. I don't know it. All. The other one is that it. it could be a really good investment, but not today, right? And so, what you need to do, or at least what I do, is I keep, you know, a list of stocks that I want to invest in when the time is right. Um, you know, maybe when we're coming out of a recession. Maybe when um, the economic outlook starts to look better. Whenever the Fed starts to ease. Um, there's, there's a lot of conditions that could make this a really good investment and to be prepared ahead of time and to know what their competitive landscape looks like, I think is very beneficial. And it's, something, Jordan, it's a good exercise to go through, um, even but Jordan though this also, might not be the perfect time to invest. But Jordan, also, I think it's really important to run the theoretical scenarios, which we have in this yeah. episode, as to what are the things that can drive DoorDash to massive growth and profitability if they execute. What are the things that can destroy DoorDash? I think we discussed both on this episode. And if you start to see e any of those things happening on either side, that's when I'm going to throw a lot of money into DoorDash. I now know what I'm looking for in DoorDash, right? So if I see them start to kind of pull the reins back on that geographic territory to increase profitability, if I see them continue to take market away, um, if I see them uh, continue to make progress with non-restaurants, right? With anything outside the rest. I, anybody can open up their DoorDash app and look at what they're doing with other partners, right? Those things are really interesting. And I could see myself taking a, a position in DoorDash in the very near term future. I haven't yet, but now I know what I'm looking for. And I think, listen, Jordan, would you agree that even if it's a 50-50 shot at this stuff working, it's probably a 50-50 shot of a five to 10 extra at least? on this it, if if it works it's not doubling your money Currently, right? i don't if know it I mean, works, think it's, it's still you're still looking at a company that's got a multiple to sales they've got debt and so you've got to take these things into account when you're looking at this right and then so I what, think is, what does the market want this thing to be priced at and it's you know it's really tough since they don't have earnings right well well jordan listen you we talk about the future i think a lot of a lot of really smart minds right now are saying the next 10 years is all about logistical leverage, right? So logistical leverage is going to have a play a huge part of the big winners over the next decade. I think DoorDash is one of a handful of companies that has potential to have massive global logistical leverage and network effect when it comes to this concept of same day last mile delivery across essentially what could be every single industry, consumer industry sector. So I think you can't look, you have to look at that and say, this is this has massive potential, massive, massive potential. There are only so many companies that could really play in that game on a global scale. 
um, and do it the way DoorDash is doing it. Because I will say this, once DoorDash gets you to become a $10 a month Dash Pass member, they got you locked in, man. They got you locked in. You are, you are literally, it's one of the apps that you're going to every single day. Dave, how many apps can you talk about that you are on essentially every single day of your life? Not that many, no, there's, right? There's not that many. I mean, your brokerage app, YouTube, Twitter, and DoorDash. Those are my those Okay, are Dave, my how main many apps. apps can you say TikTok that you are on every day? TikTok's not okay, in let me my, say this, it's guys. on my home screen, how, but it's not. How many apps are you transacting on multiple times a week? Transacting on. Oh for, yeah, the Amazon app is the other one that I, I transact on what? multiple times per week. So Amazon and DoorDash are my two biggest transactional apps, period. How can we say that and then completely ignore DoorDash? It, it, I was not a huge DoorDash believer when they IPO'd, mainly based on the hype valuations and everything. I just thought, and the competition at the time, right? Because DoorDash was one of many at the time. They, they had a lead, but one of many. I see them closing the gap. I see this essentially being, I think this could be a two horse race, quite honestly. I think this could be a DoorDash, Uber Eats, Uber, and essentially everybody else going away, especially with the moves that are making globally, guys. Yeah. And with the moves that they're making to get you on their monthly subscription, there are not a lot of companies in this space that are going to get you to pay them $10 a month. And you here's, here's, that here's something that I actually like about DoorDash over Uber is that DoorDash isn't planning to drive humans around like a taxi cab service. Like that's what Uber does. And Uber's also delivering groceries and restaurants and, and everything else. But they're, unless Uber just abandons the human transportation model, which is also going to get more profitable when you have robo cars driving people around. I'll, but I like that it's a pure play last mile delivery company. I'll take the other side of that, Dave. I think I agree that Uber's trying to do too much. And because of that, they're not doing it as well. They're not doing the delivery as well. The restaurants, I don't think, are as good. The partners aren't as good. But I will say this if I'm price conscious, and I'm only going to pay $10 a month to one of them. If I get additional benefits through Uber for you know for my ride sharing, mm -hmm. I might do Uber because I get ride sharing benefits and I get delivery benefits. I think that's actually a strength of Uber over DoorDash. So I mean we'll see how it all plays out. I think there's room for both. But this, I, I'm not invested today, but I I'm, might. I'm paying both of them $10 a month, and I get way more use out of uh, DoorDash than I do Uber because of restaurant selection, and I'm not using Uber other than to go to uh, the airport, really, and occasionally a restaurant. Uh, okay, let me just say this. Alex Strout says, you guys aren't thinking about... Com we are in Texas. You guys aren't thinking about... Com companies like Favor in Texas, for example, destroys DoorDash. I was a big Favor user, okay? I was using Favor quite a bit through the pandemic. I no longer use Favor except for like one restaurant that I can't, that's not, it's like a local diner, John's Cafe. They're not on DoorDash, and I still use Favor occasionally for them. But oh, yeah. honestly, I, I think what we're trying to say, Alex, is once you start paying DoorDash, for their subscription service, you don't want to use the competitors because you want to get your money's worth of the subscription. So I'm no longer using Favor. Yeah, and the data, I think, yeah, I, agree I don't think, that. I don't think the data supports Favor doing well, even in Texas. I think, I, I don't know, but I don't think Favor is meaningfully going to be a competitor at scale long term. I really yeah. don't think so because their driver network is just not as robust. So, I mean, there's still a lot of regional players here, guys. Like in Florida, when I'm in Florida, there was a completely different regional player in the panhandle of Florida that does all their grocery delivery there. And I think that will that will live for a while. Uh, guys, they're asking about LAC this morning. I can't mentally, like, uh, process everything happening with LLC, LAC, Lithium America, guys. I need some time to think that through before I can comment on it. I know there's a lot happening there. Uh, I so sorry. I, I know, I know. Everyone has been asking me what I think about Board Ape Yacht Club. I am taking a mental health break from the NFT sector. Uh, if you've been following me, I've mentioned this. I sold a whole lot of my NFTs a month ago, two months ago. Uh, 
I'm, I don't know, probably have 50% of what I had. I have sold all my crypto. Uh, I do like, I still like Bitcoin and Ethereum long term, but I don't own any right now. So I'm just taking a mental health, health break from the NFTs. There's too much opportunity in revenue producing assets right now for me to be focused on NFTs. Uh, I'm a big believer in NFTs long term, but for the next few weeks to a couple months, uh, I'm focused on opportunities in the public sector where I think there are some really interesting, like when we see stocks down 60, 70, 75%, I'm going to try to figure out where there's value in a company that actually produces revenue that I think will be the first to come back whenever that, whenever that is. Yeah. We come and back this summer. I think that is one of the year. big reasons that crypto is having its crypto winter is everybody's freaking out and getting out of everything. And <laughs> I'm looking more heavily into the equities market than than I was in crypto. I have not sold any of my Bitcoin or Ethereum. I've reshuffled some of the other smaller holdings that I had, but uh, yeah. And by the way, my my thesis on crypto has always been uh, just the too, too large to fail once institutions start rolling over into crypto. Uh, that is the crypto's moment. I still think that will likely happen. I just don't think it's going to be the first thing that institutions are doing when they start pouring money back in the market. I think they'll be going for revenue producing assets first and crypto next. Uh, you know, so I'm just not focused on that. S either of those sectors probably this summer. Uh, I will probably start to dip my toe back into crypto at least at some point late summer, early fall. Uh, I, you know, it's hard to time the bottom in this stuff, guys, right? Uh, but I'd rather have my money in companies that I think, and by the way, I'm not an Airbnb, but we've talked about this many times, companies that have uh, revenue and growth that are trading at discounted PEs because the market kind of flushed them down the toilet with everyone else unfairly, companies like Crocs. That, that, that's my big position right now. And by the way, I'm continuing to check on that data. I was in uh, North Park yesterday, Dave, and I interviewed one of the stores What's it North Park? Yes, North Park. One of the store managers that sells Hey Dudes. I won't say what store it was. And I do my normal thing, my normal interview. And I said, just talk to me. Were you selling Hey Dudes a year ago? She said, yes. And, and they, she told me the same thing that a few other store, store managers have told me, which is we did not get hardly any inventory of Hey Dudes last summer. Lots of demand, very limited inventory. It was a nightmare. Now we are getting lots and lots of Hey Dudes inventory. And she's like, it is selling. It is selling, selling, selling. That was great to hear. She's like, where it really sells are our stores out in the country, though, <laughs> like out of the city. It's so funny. Like their demographic is so rural. Uh, but yeah, Hey Dude seems to be having another hot summer. I think it's going to be an interesting earnings call for Crocs uh, coming up. What are we, like six weeks away from that? Uh, and that just stock so. chart is just painful this past it's painful it's Ugh. so hard to keep investing in crocs at these it it's painful but this is where money we're not financial advisors this is what i am doing uh and, and we've talked about it so many times on the show i could end up getting destroyed on this thesis but i'm sticking with it crocs is my big play. if i have one big play this summer it's crocs it's very hard to have high conviction in this market and anything and that's why i say there's no such thing as high conviction in a market where the macro supersedes any type of company news. And I still feel that way. I still feel that a recession and discounting yeah. of shoes has potential to be really damaging to Crocs. Uh, so I'm still cautious. But I, I, uh, I, on the way down, I was selling uh, about half of my Crocs. Uh, I am still I still hold the rest, and it has broken through my uh, purchase price. I'm now down 8% from where I bought it a long time ago. Yeah, it's painful, man. But, I, hey, this this is where opportunities are. This is when it's the hardest to put money in, when everyone else is selling. But, man, I, uh, I'm, I'm, willing, I'm willing to take a little, put a little risk capital into Crocs going into this next earnings. We'll see. All right, guys, anything else? Uh, sorry we're not doing shows as frequently, but you know Dave likes the summer. <laughs> I do Dave, like the summer. Dave, I, you, I do, too. But you, too. Summer, too, you're, you're uh, heading on a luxury trip here very very shortly, aren't you? Very shortly, I'll be on a luxury, uh, luxury trip. We have people staying at our house watching the cats and stuff, and uh, i got to go here in a minute to meet with that person, but... 
yeah, we're we're doing we're doing a bit of travel. We will be in Italy um, at our good friend's uh, wedding. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chase Figer uh, will be in Lake Como. We'll be in Venice and Rome and Florence and Milan. Uh, so, so for our Italian me... viewers, if you'd like to do a dumb money meetup with Chris, just DM <laughs> him on Twitter. <laughs> Oh my God! My Maybe you wife, can do a Vespa tour with some people. We have, she has like 18 museums packed every single day of this trip. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm gonna carve out to do some time with some dumb money, uh, dumb money um, uh, followers. Uh, no, but if you see me running around Italy, it it is me. Uh, <laughs> it's me. Anything else, guys? Um, I think we covered we covered everything. I think we did it. We even talked about why we were in New York yesterday. Yeah. So. This will be the summer. I think this continues to be the summer of... Although, do you know what we didn't last... cover? We didn't cover uh, this Wall Street Journal uh, post that happened oh, yesterday. No! This is, this is Twitter. <laughs> this is not... This was not, uh, Chris, in New it's York the, yesterday. This is a file photo, photo that ran on the uh, on in the Wall Street Journal, print edition and online, uh, about the uh, Robin Hood shares surging on uh, rumors that they might be bought out. But uh, Did you get royalties on that image, Chris? Dude, could you imagine the Robin Hood employees being like, "That's not our employee. Who is that guy, and why is the photograph of him?" That's that because was when Chris I was in town IPO'd for another and thing, and he, Chris had a camera crew following him around. And so I'm sure the Wall Street Journal photographer was like, oh, well, that guy must be the important one. Let me make sure I get a picture of him because he has his own camera crew and everyone else is just kind of lingering around. And Chris had the official shirt from the employees because we got that at like a conference we were at not long ago. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we were filming. There was a documentary that's coming out hopefully soon uh, covering the madness of 2020. Uh and, and, and Dumb Money is in the documentary, and uh, they were shooting at me that day at the Robin Hood IPO. Man, I, I don't know if I want to be attached to all that Robin Hood madness right now. I am no longer a Robin Hood investor. Well, you're uh, the face of it, as far as the financial <laughs> media goes. Which just shows you just how, how outdated the financial media is. If they're running a uh, photo from the IPO with, <laughs> with you as the oh poster God. boy. Listen, right. I, I do think for everyone that's so worried, because uh, we keep getting this question, what do you guys do? I mean, we're doing less. We're doing less. We're trading less. We're looking at, I'm honestly even looking at the market less. There have been days when I have barely even checked to see what the market's doing because my account is kind of balanced with uh, hedged short positions in the in the SPY and the QUQ. So when the market's up, I'm not making as much. When it's down, not losing as much. But honestly, guys, I think this summer is all about mentally preparing for if and when the macro environment stabilizes, uh, what do we want to do with our money? Like, what are the stocks that we really want to be in so we don't have to think about that stuff? If macro, if we're like all of a sudden over the course of a few weeks or a couple months, we're like, oh, all this macro stuff is starting to settle. I mean, I hope it and does. And that's why I think point. episodes like this are important to try to get people to start thinking about where do you want to be um, when things improve? You know, because Jordan, people don't think about that now. Right. And then when things do start to stabilize, by the time they start looking at stocks and it's too late, because you know, the market moves pretty quick in that environment. So I'm just creating a list, you know, like I know, I, I think Airbnb, it, it, it is one of those. Listen, it's a it's it's risk capital to be an Airbnb, right? Because there's a, a strong short thesis, but an equally strong long thesis. I don't have conviction into which one will play out. But I think if the long conviction in in this company plays out did i say airbnb uh yeah, you said you meant doordash it, doordash i think if the long conviction plays out for doordash i think it's not a 2x or i think it's a four five six ten x or could it be a 30 to 40 x or it's possible that's not for a while but it's theoretically possible on this one guys w with automation with robo delivery bots it's certainly possible that that this company can be a monster a logistics last mile monster in 12, 10, 12 years. It's a possibility. So yeah. we'll see. And with that, we're done money. We will see you back here whenever our vacation schedules allow. <laughs>